Hello and welcome to another great video for ICMI. I am Chris Bodie, and of course I'm joined by Vernon Meeks. And we are joined today with Brian Martinez. How are you doing today, Brian? I'm doing well, thank you for asking. It's just another day in America in the current year. <laughs> well said, well said, my friend. So I'm sure Brian needs no introduction at all, but I'll give a little brief for those who may not know that Brian is a member of the Honey Badger Brigade. He is basically a producer. He helps get a lot of the shows put together. He also hosts a few of his own shows on Honey Badger. And it was actually through the Honey Badgers that I first met Brian because he talked about having a web comic on I helped him set up a website to reach a wider audience. And it was a very good web comic. And then through my association with him, I got to do some work with the Honey Badgers. And that was a wonderful time. But let's go ahead and start with our interview today. How did you come into men's rights? Well, actually, I discovered it um, many years ago, maybe 2014, it, could, it might even be 2013, when I was having conversations with a friend of mine uh, regarding relationships. And so I have a lot, well, back home in Chicago, I have a lot of male friends that I knew for many years, and um, some of them are struggling with romantic relationships. And so we would have conversations, and I was too, I mean, like I you know, I dated and I got into committed relationships and then, you know, they would fall apart. And it was usually on the part of, you know, the women being, let's just say, not entirely honest about themselves. And I was starting to lose faith in the idea of relationships. And then compound on top of that, the number of friends that I had that had gone through terrible divorce and lost access to their children and all that, it all just seemed like a really bad deal. And a friend of mine told me about this phenomenon in Japan called the herbivore, uh, I don't want to call it movement, but the herbivore man phenomenon, where there were men who were essentially not getting involved in relationships, not, you know, trying to be salary men, as they would call it in Japan, and essentially not doing their solemn duty as men by participating as productive members of society according to the mainstream and i decided that it was really interesting and i wanted to look into it especially because this was happening on the other side of the world and when i searched for it i found videos by uh, two prominent and well-known men going their own way at the time uh, stardust and barbarossa and when I found their videos on the herbivore movement, I was really interested in the way they were discussing this completely because it was so, I don't want to say daring, but they, they had a degree of a will to discuss something or try to get closer to what they were, uh, what they believed to be the truth. And they were willing to say things that were kind of risky about relationships, about feminism, about women. And I wanted to learn more. I wanted to hear this because I've always been the kind of person that likes to hear someone's kind of like counter cultural or counter mainstream perspective. And I got really drawn into it. I ended up consuming a bunch of MGTOW content. And then I, because I was watching more and more of that, YouTube was recommending to me different videos. And at that time, you know, the algorithms weren't restrictive. You generally, you know, got more of what you were consuming. And in addition, the response videos were done differently too. So if you watched the video, you could see people who have done responses to that video in the description, which basically means you could like see more of the conversation that's taking place. And so from watching all this Barbarossa and Stardust, I found Sandman, I found Misandry in the Media, I found several channels that are don't exist anymore, Man, Woman, Myth, and Karen. And when I found Girl Writes What, I was blown away. And so I watched all of her videos, I binge watched them all. And so like that got me really interested and I tried bringing this stuff up with my friends and people I went to school with and 
you know, people I went to work with. And there was pushback because I was essentially like completely upsetting the paradigm that everyone believes that we live under. And of course, that's going to make people angry because they tend to be comfortable in the their sort of knowledge of the world or their understanding of the world as it is. But while it did happen, I did get a lot of people that created some interest. They were like, you know what, that, that, that sounds like it makes sense. And I think I'm going to look into that too. And I guess I never looked back, really. It's just been that, you know, ever since. And then um, I somehow, and I don't remember how I came across it, but it was probably because I was following a lot of like men's rights oriented spaces on social media, like Twitter and Facebook. I ended up becoming friends with Crystal Garcia, who used to work with Honey Badger Radio. And I knew she worked worked with Honey Badger Radio because I was watching HBR videos, even going back to when it was on blog talk radio. And I didn't know much about how all that stuff worked, but I knew that I wanted to hear this conversation. And then Crystal saw some of my artwork and she saw that I was working on a comic book that was talking about relationships, which I had started before I took an interest in men's rights, or even I just knew there was something about the dynamic between men and women that was wrong. And that was like my way of sort of like trying to get closer to it, to try to understand it was to draw from my own history in relationships and my own understanding or belief in what a relationship is and like how that has changed. And so Crystal saw my work. She really liked it. And she asked me to make a few editorial pieces for the Honey Badger Radio website. And so I did. And then one day, I think I was talking to Crystal about some issues I was having with my, uh, at that time, webcomic called Good Guy, involving my professors at school at the time, as well as my classmates, because they were all so troubled and bothered and irritated with the fact that I would want to tell a a story about romance from the perspective of a heterosexual male or normal guy, right? After that, I I told Crystal about it. She told Allison about it, I guess. And then she, Allison reached out to me and asked me to be a guest on the show and talk about my experience. And so I did. And um, yeah, I mean, I basically was at first an occasional guest. And then um, Allison asked me if I would be willing to host some shows. And so I said, yeah, I'll do it. I learned or taught myself how to use the tools. And now here I am basically doing, you know, several shows a week and talking about these issues. So I want to interject for a moment. I find it interesting that you got started in 2013 and I got started in 2014, but what kind of links all of this is your comic because how I got involved I mean I did a little bit of things before I was part of Honey Badgers but what really got me involved was your web comic and that's like that's powerful right there that that's what got you in the movement that's what really got me started in the movement and it's a really good comic I don't know if you're still publishing it at all but I enjoyed it when it was out Yeah, I had to stop uh, because I had to focus on my work and survival. And then as things became more and more politically tumultuous, I had to like put it on the back burner for a number of reasons because I just there just isn't enough time. I think that it's not a bad project and it is a way to get people thinking about these things. So, yeah, in that regard, I agree. Well, now you guys are getting me uh, curious. You might have talked about the Good Guy comic before, but I don't know much about it. I obviously haven't read it. So could you tell me more about it? You said a heterosexual relationship, but what more is it? Yeah, well, I mean, basically, I wanted to essentially like explore, I guess you could think of it as a self-authoring or therapeutic exercise where I was basically reliving all of my experiences with women through storytelling while also sort of talking about my own situation at home, what I believed and how those beliefs had evolved, not just beliefs about romance, but beliefs about what it means to be a man, what my thoughts on sex and everything else, right? And so I was exploring those and it starts when I'm like 14 is where the story begins. And I'm just starting my first day of high school. 
I had noticed girls at this point already, but I was not sexually active and I was intent at that time on saving myself for the one. I had this idea or this notion of the one, right? And all of my experiences with girls were essentially like communicating what I learned. And again, this is just my experience. So I'm not trying to say this is like a universal experience because I don't do that. But what I had learned is that my idea of what a good and healthy relationship is and the ideas as it's held by many of the girls that I attempted to date or I went out with or I even had a relationship with were very different. And what I learned from each experience you know, that sort of like you've developed me into the person I am today. And so it's a little self-indulgent, which is one of the other reasons why I kind of, you know, moved away from the book because I felt maybe a little self-conscious that it might come across as narcissistic and self-indulgent, which I don't think it is. But if I'm like trying to communicate an idea, drawing from personal experience, tends to be the most useful way to do it because, you know, you know what happened to you. So, or what you've been through or however you want to phrase it. So, yeah, I mean, basically it's a silly like look, or it it almost has like a, you could say a teen drama uh, with, with some humor uh, vibe to it. And the, the point is, you know, to, to see all these. So think of it like wonder years, but like drawn as a comic book. So, and like the later wonder years when he got a little older and he started making out with Winnie, not, not when they were little, little kids. <laughs> so. Yes. I think I got your point on that one. So let's talk a little bit about what you just brought up with relationship. I certainly experienced that myself growing up that it's like my perception of what a relationship was or what I wanted to be was vastly different than what it turned out to be. And it sounds like you had a very similar experience to that. And it took a lot of trial and error and some hard lessons to really understand what dating and relationships actually are. And you've talked about wanting to define masculinity. Why do you think men growing up have such a difficult time understanding relationships? I mean, that's something we all want, and yet it seems to be a complete mystery. Well, I think that the issue is in many ways, men and women have drifted apart in terms of like our understanding of what a relationship is. But maybe I'm not the best example because when I was little, when I was young and I hadn't been dating or whatever, I had a kind of idealistic view on what I thought a relationship and then a marriage and then a family would look like. I had an idea and it was, it was very idyllic and it was what I was aiming for. And my parents who appeared to have, you know, something of an example of that, right. They were happy together. They had three kids, you know, I thought, well, yeah, I want what, what my dad has. And and I didn't think it would be that much of a, a crazy thing, But the problem was, is that the environment that I lived in and where I went to school and all of that was full of people, male and female, who didn't have that same idealized vision because they didn't live in an environment where that was normal. Most of them were raised by single mothers. They lived, they were very poor um, or, you know, they were for whatever reason, perhaps as estranged from their dads, they never knew him, they don't know who he is. And so the girls, because I mean, obviously, the boys that were experiencing that they could have been my friends, but m- much of the time, I didn't make friends with boys who didn't have fathers, not because I was being selective in that way, it just so happened that the boys who were typically growing up without fathers and being raised by single moms, they were more inclined or more likely to engage in criminal behavior, to join gangs. And where I lived in Chicago was like pretty gang infested, right? So I didn't want to be around gangs. I found the whole idea of it to be disgusting. And that partly is because I had my father. But uh, the people who I did make friends with that were boys were kids that also had fathers. And I didn't really put that together that we were sort of clicking in that way, but there it was. 
But with the girls, because the way that the effects of fatherlessness impacts girls differently, they become more, uh, let's say, sexually aggressive. That's what I experienced. They tended to hit puberty earlier, be more sexually active, and also get pregnant. And that was basically how that manifested. And so a lot of the girls around me and many of them were, you know, really attracted to me, like they were trying to have sex with me and I would like turn them down because uh, it didn't feel right or whatever. And I was like 15. So it wasn't like I had, I had a degree of discipline over my sexuality. And there were many girls, I can think of a, a few right off the top of my head that attempted to aggress against me sexually. I wouldn't say that, you know, it wasn't a rape because nothing happened. I just turned them down, but they were so upset by that. And it just made me think like, is this what girls are like? And it was just so different from what I thought. And there was even a girl who, and I was going to write about her in, in, in the good guy book, but there was one girl who basically had everything that I wanted in, you know, like she had her father in her life. She seemed really sweet. She was really smart. She was creative. She had all these things that I wanted in a girlfriend and hopefully more, you know, down the line. But she also turned out to be, you know, kind of, um, well, a thought, really. I mean, I don't know how else to put it so I guess without making this too personal, uh, my sexual experiences and near sexual experiences kind of like was a massive wake up call that was a drifting apart of male sexuality and female sexuality. This isn't to say that there aren't men who still like sex. I mean, I still do. Most men do. But there is a difference in how I think that we have been misled, put it that way on what it is that men want and what it is that women want. And it's not quite as simple as it's usually presented in the mainstream. Would you say that male sexuality is something that men are not in touch with themselves nowadays? Because you mentioned the divide between the female sexuality and the male sexuality, but in terms of kind of really understanding it themselves, do you think men are kind of demonize it themselves or do they, are they kind of fine with it or... Yeah, I think that they do. And I think our society does. We treat male sexuality as predatory. We treat it as aggressive. We treat it as violent and rapey. And yes, it's true that feminism is responsible for about 99% of all of that sort of social conditioning to treat a male presence even as kind of, you know, predatory. And I hate to say this because I do have a lot of respect for, even though I'm not religious, I have a lot of respect for the good that Christianity has done, but it allowed feminism to get its foot in the door with that because in many ways, Christianity itself also treated male sexuality as like something that soils women, right? It it makes them less pure. We consider female virginity to be something pure and male virginity to be something shameful, which doesn't make sense because, you know, in order for a man to stop being a virgin, he has to have sex with a woman. Mostly I put this on feminism, but I think that it's just using the tools that already exist to make things worse. So I do think that men don't have a healthy connection to their own sexuality, just as they don't have a healthy connection to their own masculine identity, Um, which I know that a lot of people in the men's movement and MGTOW and stuff, they don't like the idea of anyone even trying to broach the subject of what it means to be a man and what manhood is, because they have this thing where they invoke in their minds, they think that when someone is talking about that, they're doing the conservative thing, you know, be a man, man up. But that's not it. I mean, there is such a thing as a masculine self. There is such a thing as masculine identity. And it is something that is real that we should be able to talk about. And it doesn't mean that we're telling men what they have to be or how they have to behave to be considered a man. Most of that actually comes from women. Women, regardless of whether they're feminist, leftist women, or if they're conservative women, it's women that basically define masculinity in our sort of broader social cultural context. I'm not saying that they should, 
but that's where things are today, you know? And this is a challenge because men want to live up to whatever women say men should be doing to live up to, you know, their standards, right? Whatever women's standards are, men feel the desire to, to live up to them because men move in accordance with women's desire. So if women say, I'm looking for a man like Zach Galifianakis, which they did when the movie The Hangover came out, because they thought he was funny and women's desires are fleeting, but we don't pay attention to that. We just hear a woman saying, I I want a guy like Zach Galifianakis, and men try to figure out how to be like Zach Galifianakis, because men want to be what women want. But I don't think, and this is the thing that um, I think makes this conversation around masculinity interesting, I don't think that masculinity is defined by women. I think that we've fallen into the trap of thinking that. But what men who follow women's desires in order to please them are doing is they are, in many ways, acting out their relationship with their mothers. So they're looking for approval from the mom. And the mom, it may not literally be their mother, but they see women in the position of the mother. Uh, in a matriarchal position. And so the men try to appease that, but that's not how it works. I believe that masculinity, you know, I already said it's real. I already said that there is something to it. There is something about being a man that's real, but I think that it is something that should come from men, like other men. And I I think that uh, a man who has a healthy relationship with other men is a better or more well-rounded self-actualized man than a man who is trying to be what women want him to be. And women will simply adapt their desires around the shape of men more broadly, if that makes sense. So they don't get to dictate the terms. In my opinion, I think that that should come from men. So this is why we should be talking about what masculinity is and what it means to be a man. And we can do that without necessarily giving all of the authority on that over to women, because I don't think women should get to decide that. In regards to masculinity, something that has been a big issue for me, and actually something Vernon recently wrote an article on, is male emancipation. The idea that instead of falling into this trap of men have to get married as soon as they can. They have to have the kids. They have to have the horrible job that pays a lot of money and sacrifice themselves only to wind up divorced. And instead of doing all of that, they live for themselves. They go out, they get the job they want. If they want a relationship, great. If not, and the most important thing to getting the woman you desire is being your best self. So what is your thoughts on that? Is that something that men should aspire to? Or is there something else that we need to do to regain our masculinity? This is a little bit tricky because this is something else I've been thinking about with regards to masculinity. I think that men should be free to live their life however they choose. And I mean, like, I will always side on liberty in every possible context, no matter what the question is, I'm going to lean towards that. People should be free to choose to live however they like. And if other people want to shame them, who gives a shit? Just go ahead and do you, right? I can't shame men for choosing to do what they want to do. I'll just tell them that I disagree and I think that they're wrong and then we'll just move on. But it is a little bit tricky because some men are not going to get married. Some men are going to live as bachelors. Some men are only going to pursue the jobs that they feel would give them the most happiness, which might be something to do with, you know, a particular passion they have that is more about pursuing something they enjoy as opposed to pursuing something that is the most fiscally responsible. That is true. And I think that men should be able to do it. But I think that the majority of men, unfortunately, well, whether it's unfortunate or not, the majority of men are going to want to find a good, honorable woman, marry her, take care of her and start a family. And they're also going to want to do something that is good for their community. They're going to want to provide and protect for their, not just for their women and their children, but for the broader society. And you know, this is true because if you look around the fact that we're sitting here talking to each other, 
from our homes on the internet that runs on electricity, you know, that uses fossil fuels, that all of the things that we have, all of these conveniences and amenities that we have is a product of men doing jobs they probably otherwise wouldn't have done because they want to earn money to feed their families and give their communities, you know, the most amount, I guess you could say, of benefit. And so I'm not going to discourage those men because I do think that realistically, if we want a society, there probably should be people having children, starting families and getting married. I don't think that getting married, starting a family, and even providing for that family is what a lot of people refer to as a trad con position. I don't think that it is. I think that it's normal for us. It's not a political choice that someone is making. All mammals are pair bonders. And so that is how we work as people. And I have to allow for people to do that freely. So if we're, uh, on the one hand, I agree, 100% that men should be free to choose. But if we uh, allow them to be free to choose, don't be surprised when most of them choose to get married, start families, and take care of their wives and kids. Just like women, it's the same thing when the feminist movement pushed for equality, like as much equality as possible. And you can look at, you know, like the Nordic countries like Sweden, where if you allow for like absolute access women tend to what? They tend to find men, get married, start families, and be stay-at-home housewives. I don't think that's a trad composition. I think that that's just what humans are going to do if you allow them. The problem is, is that, well, first of all, there's all these like terrible laws on the books regarding things like divorce and child custody and paternity fraud and all of these other legal problems that make that whole thing less appealing But what that results in is that you get men that really want a family and they want children. I mean, I think that probably the overwhelming majority are invested in this concept of legacy. Like they want some kids so that it's their way of, I guess you could say, living forever through their kids, right? So most people want this, but the the laws are discouraging. And then when you take on top of that, so the laws discourage men from getting married because it's like, well, what's in it for me? Then you add on top of that all of the social messaging about how women don't need men. And a lot of women buy into this narrative. Men are not really useful around the house and they're not good fathers and all of this. And so you get a situation where men are being sort of socially coerced away from that which they really desire and they have to like find ways to rationalize that so that they don't regret it and women are also doing the same especially since the state basically takes care of them which by the way it only does because it takes money from men so whether men are getting married or they're going full-on MGTOW monk you're paying for a woman. It doesn't matter, you know, one way or the other. So when you have all of the social and cultural upheaval, it serves to, you know, create a situation where we're having this discussion, like, should men be able to just be bachelors? Well, yeah, of course. But the thing is, is that I don't think that's what most men want. And I don't think it's what most women want. But there's all of these additional forces. And most of the people, by the way, behind all this garbage are married with children. (laughs) So, you know, like Gloria Steinem, I think, you know, she was married to the same guy for a really long time. So she's not living by the things that she's asking other women to live by for as one example. So like what that, then the question becomes, what is the purpose of this? And is it good for society that there are fewer families being formed, that there are more children growing up without fathers, that the taxation on men is only growing and growing and growing. Like uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer of Michigan State recently wrote a, a law or a bill or something that essentially removed taxes from female hygiene products. Like that's going to make a dent at all. Meanwhile, if there's any cost to pay, men have to pick up the slack. So it's like one of those things where 
a man can choose to be like, I'm not going to get married. I'm not going to have any kids. I'm going to stay away from women. I'm going to work this job that I really like, even if it doesn't pay me that much. And I'm going to live like this. And he can absolutely do that for the end of his days. But he has not actually escaped the system. The, the system is still taking money from him. And it's still, and the fact that he is not starting families and he's not having kids when he's smart enough to know that families and children are important and fathers are important. He's actually giving them what they want because he's operating within their paradigm, right? So like the best men I know aren't having kids, which is a shame because they'd be the best fathers I know. I actually agree with you that it's not a tradcon position to just have pair bond and have kids, right? But I do think that the trad composition is to throw everything at the family at the expense of yourself. In terms of my male emancipation idea, I, I tend to think it as another aspect of a man's own freedom to have his family, to have his, his children. I would say that, you know, he should not only do the things he wants, aside from balancing having a family, but I think he'll be good example for his own children because they'll have a role model to look up to. Because I've heard of conservatives saying, get married at as early as 21. And I think that's a bit, a bit too soon, because now we're talking about a rush situation, and we are having kids before we really know what to do with them. And I think that could actually cause uh, some strife and some broken families. What do you say to that? There are conservatives that push for that kind of thing. And the problem is, we were able to start families much younger. But the reason for that was because we also, there was two, two things that come to mind. Number one, we prepared children for adulthood much better and much sooner. For example, because this still goes on today, the bar mitzvah, which, and, and there are plenty of other, uh, of other kind of male coming of age rituals that exist around the world. But the bar mitzvah is the one that people tend to know. Once your bar mitzvah is done, you've done all the things associated with it. You're considered a man and everyone treats you as one. And, you know, you basically just become a man. And it changes a child when they turn 13 and they go through all that because everyone views them that way. And what that I think that why that is the case is because what I hear from a lot of conservatives today is that they're essentially confused about how much chaos is in the world right now. And a lot of this is due to a feminine way of looking at organizing the world. And I mean that 100%. We have basically organized our whole world, especially because of COVID and everything else, in a feminine oriented way, which basically puts a priority on security over liberty. And this is why everything is happening as it is. And this is security trumps liberty thing, which is a feminine thing, is basically all over our culture. It's all over our political structure. It's how we deal with all of our problems. It's how we uh, educate our children. It's everywhere. Okay. And what that, um, the reason why that's going on is because the one thing that we have not done, and this is what conservatives uh, get wrong as well, is that what conservatives are doing, not all of them, but some, because I think that they're starting to wake up. I saw the Josh Hawley thing, and I think that he's on the right path. And if anyone is going to shake out of this, it's going to be people on the right that are starting to sort of at least have these conversations, right? So the one thing that I think that we're missing here is that a person cannot have or cannot be told to be responsible for something if they don't also have authority over that thing. I'll give you an example of something that is like that, but it's completely unfair because it's unbalanced. I do a second job as a substitute teacher. And where we sub or where I work, if you work in education, you will, as a man, you one, the first thing you'll notice is that you're probably the only man in the building because it's all run by women, right? The teachers are almost all women, and they also happen to also be feminist women, like 85% of the time. Even in conservative towns like the one I live in, they're still, a feminist mindset is not contingent on whether or not you are a liberal or conservative. You just have to be basically uh, female-minded in terms of their priorities, right? In terms of your priorities. So as a substitute teacher, 
I am responsible for the children in the classroom, but I have no authority over them. So I cannot make them do anything. I can't touch them. I can't raise my voice at them. I, I have to operate basically as a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest because I don't have any authority, but I have to convince the children that I do somehow so that they will listen to me. And some children figure out right away, oh, these people can't do anything. They don't have any authority. So I can just do whatever I want. And if they try something, I'll accuse them of being a pedophile, of being an abuser or something like that. So, and this is just what we've asked of men and what feminism has asked of men for like the last 100 plus years is essentially to be responsible for women, i.e. pay your taxes, i.e. protect women at the cost of your own life if need be from anyone who wants to be violent or rapey or whatever intervene you know get involved go fight our wars do all these things you have all of this responsibility and no authority you can't tell women what to do you can't ask women you know to like i don't know be honest about whether or not they're using birth control you you cannot do that so when you do that when you give men all the responsibility and none of the authority you're going to get this chaos you're going to get this level of uh where all these problems are going on so the conversation that probably should be happening should people have authority and responsibility like this i think it's obvious but that's the conversation we ought to be having. And the way that we do things right now is that men have all the responsibility and none, none of the authority. And women have all of the authority and none of the responsibility. So we give women absolute carte blanche to basically like do whatever they want. And we celebrate everything they do. We never criticize them. And if someone even says, what about men? A bazillion articles get written saying, ha, 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 how could you even bring that up? What are you, a misogynist? Which, by the way, misogyny is a meaningless word and it's not real. It, it only exists to control people, in my opinion. The other thing is I, I agree that men should be able to live as they want. But the problem is, is that if we're not having a discussion about men's authoritative position in families and in relationships, which if we're going to make them responsible, we have to give them authority. If we're not having that conversation, then we're really just, we're not talking about this in an honest way. I want to bring up the vote for a moment. Ever since we gave women the vote, they have only voted in their own self-interest, and they've only taken more and more away from men. And the reason for this is not because I think that women are inherently evil, but I do think that if you give people political power, but no skin in the game, they're only going to exercise that political power for their own benefit, because that's what they're going to start to think political power is. It's a lever that you pull to get stuff. Now, when the suffragette movement was pushing for the vote, they called the vote a human right, even though it's not a human right. It's a privilege. And more than that, it's a responsibility. And so even when we gave women the vote, what we did was we essentially gave women the vote for nothing, no cost, no, no risk, no investment, nothing. We just gave it to them, full stop. And even then we made the men's vote conditional. Well, yeah, you can vote, but you have to sign up for selective service. You have to be prepared to be conscripted. And even if it wasn't for war, it was for other things. Like you had to be part of a bucket brigade. But there was an expectation that men had to serve. And in exchange, they had a say in the political process. And so when we gave women the vote without even having a discussion about what the potential ethical pitfalls will be, they immediately started voting for what they wanted. And now we live in a time where, what, we have more and more people agitating for socialism, most of them women. We have more and more people asking for free stuff. We have more and more people asking for maternity leave and paternity leave and all of these things, all of these things that cost taxpayer dollars that men pay 80% of. And I know that these things don't sound like they're men's issues. And this is one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot, but they really are because this is the where we are now started then. It started when we forgot what, what men had to sacrifice. This is the only way we could have 
essentially treated the thing that men fought and died for as something we could just give to women for nothing. And then we call men privileged. I am troubled by this because it is a, a conversation that most people find really hard to have, but we have to be able to have it in an honest way. And I don't think that simply like including women in the draft is going to solve the problem. I think it's going to make more problems and we have to be able to talk honestly about it. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have brought up a lot of great points and I would love to discuss this with you in more detail. I feel like if we had a couple of hours, I think we could get across some great insights. But we have to close. So uh, what are some best ways for people to uh, find your content, your work? I guess the best place is just to go to honeybadgerbrigade.com. Follow us on YouTube and Twitch as well at Honey Badger Radio. And on YouTube, there's a, another channel called Badger Live Streams. That's Badger Live Streams, plural, that I host most of the content on. That is where I do my weekly news show where we basically talk about all of the events or the news that's happened in the week, but we put a men's issues twist on it. So we try to bring attention to men's issues in everyday news stories that most people typically treat as, let's say, a political football. I think that there is another angle here that is, you know, usually missing from that discussion. And I also have an occasional call-in show called Brian's Badger Lodge, where I try to talk specifically about men and masculinity in lots of different contexts. So, but there's a, all the shows are good. HBR Talk, HBR Debate, the, the Rant Zerkers, uh, they, it's all good. So yeah, that's uh, honeybadgerbrigade.com. Honey Badger Radio on most social like video hosting sites and Badger live streams on YouTube for the live shows. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming out today. And I hope you have a great day today. All right. Thank you. Thank you.